Well, this morning we are on week 30 of our journey through the story. And I enjoyed it as I've watched some videos of um, how Oak Hills did this. Last week's video was the one where Randy Frazee subbed in um, for Max Lucado. And so in this week's video, when Max did it, he said, now I understand that last week Randy tried to say that there were more people that brought their stories when he was here than when I normally am. So he made up a story about installing cameras in the ceiling of the church to be able to scan barcodes and count how many there were. But if you've got your story with you, would you show me? Okay. 30 weeks now, we've been going through this journey together, and there's one left after today. And I'm kind of sad. I've been enjoying this. I don't know about you, what it's stirring in you about reading your Bibles. Um, I hit a milestone yesterday. This reading plan I've been telling you about of reading 10 chapters a day. Well, yesterday was day 250. And so I've read at least 2,500 chapters out of the Bible. There's not 2,500 chapters, by the way. There's 1,189 chapters in the whole Bible. So some of them I've read more than once. Things like the book of Acts that I'm like the ninth time through. And I just fall in love with God's word. And the story, and today's story, much of it it falls in the end of the book of Acts. So I want to encourage you, if you've got your stories, turn open to chapter 30 this morning. Now what's interesting as we get into this morning's story is that there are two very important people that lived in the city of Rome for a short time in the seventh decade. Now, there were two very, very different people. Um, One was the Apostle Paul, and the other was Emperor Nero. Some of you may have heard a little bit about Nero. Their time together overlapped for a little bit in the city of Rome, and you couldn't have had two more different characters than these two. Nero, uh, at the age of 25 was emperor and thought rather highly of himself, and so did everyone else. At 25, he had considered himself to be deity and made a 120-foot tall statue of himself in the city of Rome. You might say to everyone who was there that Nero was a hero, while Paul was a zero. Most, if you would ask the name of Paul, would say, Paul who? They would not know him. Nero, on the other hand, was gaining huge popularity. I mean, if he was in today's world, you know, President Obama would invite him to a state dinner. Oprah would want Nero to come on a show with her. Larry King was still doing his show. He'd be all over the place. But Paul, not so much. And so you couldn't have two more different characters. Now, Nero um, was married to a Papia Sabina. She was a blonde, head-turning beauty who bathed in donkey milk. I've never heard of that one before. But it just so happens that they kept 400 donkeys in the stables near his palace to provide the milk for her to bathe in. Nero had a thing for soft skin. And so his beauty was bathed in donkey milk. Not only that, but she would be dried by swan feathers and massaged with crocodile mucus. But it made really soft skin. I don't, ladies, next, when you go home and read that skin conditioner, check and see if crocodile mucus is on the list of ingredients. I don't know. With that 120-foot statue, people looked up to Nero. And people looked down to Paul. You see, Paul went around making claims about this Jewish teacher as though he was some kind of God. And so what do the Romans do? They take a person like that and they put him in jail. Now this morning as we get into this 
last days of Paul. I'll set it up now. Some of you may be going through struggles in life. Whether it's a career change, whether it's how to deal with your kids, whether it's how to deal with your in-laws. Oh, by the way, that one of those things called a holiday is coming up this week, right? So you get to have to deal with in-laws, and some of you kind of dread that. Paul um, teaches us a lot about life. In fact, if you were to turn in a Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 kind of lists what the life of Paul was like. It says in chapter 11 at verse 24, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. You see, Jews thought it would be inhumane to be able to whip somebody 40 times, but 39 was okay. And five times he had received that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul says, through all of these things, the thing that keeps me going, the thing that really gets me, is my concern for all of the churches. And that's why we see in the life of this man, one who, when God got his attention, said, God, all of it's yours, and whatever you say I will do, wherever you say I should go, I will go. That's why we sang that song last week. Paul traveled around to some of the most exotic places in the known world. Not on vacation, not to go deep sea diving. No, he traveled on foot. He traveled by boat. He traveled by horseback. And he traveled, and he traveled, and he traveled. Planted at least ten churches during his lifetime. And countless more have been planted because of the way that he shared the good news. Paul dedicated his very life. The message that Paul taught everywhere that he went was singular in nature. It was, how do we get to a relationship with Jesus Christ? It's not about how we perform different religious functions, how do we do other things to appease an angry God. It was all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this one message he simplified in his letter to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. He said, this is what it's all about. Your faith is a gift from God. It is grace. It is nothing you've done to earn. Your salvation comes because of a relationship with Almighty God through His Son. And this was the message that Paul preached and taught. Paul lived a difficult life. As you read through, and if you've read the chapter, you know of the examples that he gave. That Paul was what we call a tent maker. He worked a job outside of just sharing the good news. He earned a living in other ways to provide for his means to be able to go and to share the good news. In one of his letters, he proclaimed how excited he was that he didn't have to take a salary from a church to provide for his needs. He provided for his own. What a great example. But Paul said, the worker is worth his wages. And Paul went around, and he would work part of the day, and he would teach. We talked last week about the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where he spent two years in Ephesus. So he would work through the morning, and in the afternoon, he would spend hours teaching every day. One source 
recorded it. And during that time, he had over 3,000 hours that he had taught in that lecture hall. Day after day after day, but not on Sabbath. And day after day after day, but not on Sabbath. And day after day after day, he would teach and teach and teach. Paul's life was not about himself. It was all about serving others. It'd be one thing if Paul got to just travel. But if you know the story, if you've read the chapter, Paul did whatever God said. And he went wherever God said to go. And sometimes that landed him in a little bit of trouble. Sometimes that landed him in a lot of trouble. And so if you open up your stories... In the beginning, it tells the story of Paul's last journey to Jerusalem. On page 441, it says, The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. My goodness. Do you know what he had done that had caused such an uproar? He's in his own country. He's in the city of Jerusalem around his own countrymen. And he's done nothing wrong. He's made a vow. He's had his head shaved. And he's at the temple praying, worshiping. And there's a speculation that he's had somebody who's an outsider with him. In the days up to this, he'd had the outsider with him, but not in the temple. That's against Jewish laws. This is that among his own countrymen, there's such an uproar that they are trying to kill him. And what a switch. We go back to Acts chapter 9. Here's the guy who had been going around killing Christians. Getting letters from the authorities to be able to go down to other places and chase down believers of the way. Because he thought it was an abomination of the Jewish faith. And now as he's living according to Jewish customs and laws, his own people are ready to kill him. And as they take him into custody and prepare to beat him and then find out, oh, he's a Roman citizen, so we better not beat him. Paul ends up getting taken to Caesarea Philippi to be able to stand trial. On the way, he finds out before he leaves, his nephew finds out that there's a plot afoot to kill Paul. Forty men have vowed they will not eat or drink until Paul is dead. Funny to see if they held on to that conviction because they never got there. Paul was taken by two centurions, a leader of a hundred, on cavalry and with soldiers to protect him, to get him to Caesarea Philippi, where he ended up staying for two years. During the time he was there, he had opportunity over and over to share with leaders the story of Jesus and his love. Why Jesus was the fulfillment for those who understood the Old Testament. Why Jesus was the fulfillment of the Messiah. And Paul, when he knew there was another plot to take his life, said, I appeal to Caesar. If I'm not going to get justice here, then send me to Rome. During that time, as you read on through the chapter, it shares other parts of the book of Acts. I love it because it's like a suspense novel. It's not quite so suspenseful to me anymore because I kind of know how the story goes. But if you read it and you just pick it up and read the book of Acts, begin it like at chapter 9 and read through the end of chapter 28. It's a suspense novel of what God does in the life of this man. Paul travels along and as he's on boat to travel, they're shipwrecked. And what happens to Paul? But he's on this island 
And he goes, and as they're collecting firewood, all of a sudden, a viper jumps out of the fire and latches onto his hand, and all the villagers say, Aha! The goddess Justice has got him. He tried to escape from the sea, but that didn't work. So they watch, and they wait, and they watch, and they wait, expecting that he's going to swell up or just keel over. And after a long time passes, they made the decision, hmm, maybe he's a god, and they should worship him. And Paul says, no. Let me tell you how it really works. Let me tell you about this great God who has created everything that you've ever known. And he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. He sent his son to die for you on a cross. And he rose again from the dead and paid for your sins that separated you from him. That's the kind of thing that happens with Paul. Paul finally gets to Rome. Where he again awaits trial for another couple years in his own apartment. He's given some freedom. But he can't travel about as much as he would like. And while it would be one thing to know if Paul had the freedom to just travel, we know Paul more because of the words that he wrote to encourage and strengthen the churches that he had been a part of beginning and others that he just knew of that had started, and he encouraged them as well. Paul wrote words like, Be anxious for nothing. Our citizenship is in heaven. He spoke of the love of Christ which passes knowledge. He asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then proceeds to answer his own question in four paragraphs to summarize it with one word. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Paul could encourage in one breath and in another bring things right to a point. The letter that he wrote to the church in Galatia. He wrote, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Who's come in and told you these other things that aren't the truth? And he had some great words of encouragement for the men who had come in and shared these false truths. <laughs> like there is such a thing. To the church in Corinth that had lots of chaos. He wrote words like, you do wrong and cheat and do these, those things to your brethren. Paul could encourage in one breath and bring about the issue in another. But Paul, well, his life was completely changed when he met Jesus on that Damascus road. And it was never, ever the same again. And Jesus understood that word of grace. Paul understood that word of grace. And Paul taught it over and over. By grace you have been saved. You can earn salvation no more than you can earn a mother's love. You are justified freely by this grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whether he was comforting or correcting, it was all because of Christ. Jesus had come into his life and it's the encouragement that he has for all of us. Everywhere he went, though, he caused an uproar. He did not just slip in and be unnoticed. Paul wrote words of encouragement. Many of you tried to memorize these. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that's, a, that's a phrase I want you to huh, take hold of today. Do you know why God wants to take hold of you? Now, some of us, we've done things, then we want to hide out in the backyard as kids. We don't want to come in the house because we know we've done something. And we're afraid of the punishment that's waiting for us. And we know that mom or dad is going to hold on to us in a way that we're not going to enjoy. And some approach God that way. As though God got a thrill out of punishing. They haven't read the Bible. They haven't read over and over and over of this thing called grace. Of God's great love that he's not waiting to see, when did you slip up? 
He's looking to see, when can I bless? When will they understand my great love for them and accept that and go deeper in a relationship with me? That's what Paul knew. Paul knew the guilt of all the things he had done before coming to Jesus Christ. He knew all the things he had done to put to death men, women, and children who knew Jesus is their Savior. But he knew he'd been forgiven. And it changed his life. He had received grace. And the words after these in verse 13 to 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And the question is, how are you living today? Are you living in that freedom that comes by knowing Christ? Are you still being dragged down by the things of the past? Have you set your goal on what lies ahead? Paul shared the reason why. I want you to open your stories. I want you to flip ahead near the end of the chapter. It's on page 456 at the bottom. I don't have these on the screen. But read along with me. Well, I'll read it. You don't have to read out loud. You can read silently. The bottom of the page, 456, 2 Timothy chapter 1, it's verses 8 through 12. Paul says, this is how. He says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who was, has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. It's the secret to how Paul lived. He had a cornerstone in his life that he built everything else upon. A faith in Jesus Christ. Knowing that this world is temporary and there is something waiting beyond this. And Paul said, it's all to you. I will build on this foundation alone. I don't know what kind of chaos is going on in your life. As we've been going through the story, we've been talking about the upper story and the lower story. That in the lower story are the events of the people we would read about. People like you and I. People that had challenges, people that had chaos, people that had confusion, people that had concerns, people that had cancer, people that had cares, people that had, I don't know, car payments, the chariot payments, I don't know. They had all of the dysfunctions that you and I see in life. And yet we read of an upper story. That God has had a plan from the beginning of time for you and I. That each of us are not just random beings. But God has created each one of us to love us. And he has a purpose, a specific purpose for each one of our lives. As we discover the way that he's gifted us and begin to put those gifts into use to build up the body of the church. We see all kinds of amazing things happen. Paul's gift was to go and encourage. Paul's gift was to encourage from a distance. And he used the gifts that God had given him. And because of that, he is the most influential writer of all time. Today, I'm very hard-pressed to find an epistle by Nero that people read. I don't know if you've ever looked, but I have never found a cathedral 
to St. Nero. But I found lots of buildings with Paul's name on it. Have you ever met a person named Nero? Maybe a dog? But how many of you know at least one Paul or Pauline? The influence that God has done through this man is immense. 2,000 years later, so many people know him by name. And God has preserved the writing that he did to encourage people in their faith in trusting in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But all did not go easy for Paul. The last days of Paul's life that we know are recorded in 2 Timothy. Some of you had a chart like this you got last week. If you don't have one of these, if you missed last week, I encourage you to grab one. There's more back there, I believe. But 2 Timothy is the last one that Paul wrote. I heard these words shared at a funeral a couple weeks ago for a, a friend of mine who's a pastor. I had gotten to know him a little bit since I moved here to Indiana. Others who performed the funeral knew him much better and talked about the parallels with Richard LePage in what Paul wrote in the end of the letter to Timothy. Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We're all involved in a fight of some kind. The question is, are you fighting the good fight? Are you engaging in a battle that has eternal effects? Are you engaged in a battle for souls? Engaged in, not against flesh and blood. Paul wrote that, that it, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and powers in the heavenly realms. Our battle was never against flesh and blood. But are you engaged in the battle? Are you fighting the good fight the way that Paul says he fought? Are you working to finish the race and look back and say no regrets? Paul lived his life in such a way that he could encourage young Timothy to say, model what I've done. Live the way that I have lived. Use the gifts that God has given you. Do the work out of an evangelist and share the good news. I want to encourage you this morning to get in the battle. There are people all around us who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. They may know of his name. I love that. One of my favorite stories there was early on in the book of Acts when there were seven sons of a Jewish priest named Siva. And they would go around and confront evil spirits and say, in the name of the Jesus that Paul speaks about, I command you, get out. And once upon a time, there were some demons who confronted him and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And they received such a beating from the man who was overpowered by the spirits that these seven sons left naked and bleeding the scene. Because they didn't really know Jesus. They were fakers. They were pretenders. I want you to encourage you to, to know Jesus. Know the real Jesus. We're going to be talking about him a lot coming up in two weeks as we begin our Christmas season. Next week is the conclusion to the story. And we talk about the end of times. Oh, we'll talk about Jesus next week. Don't worry. We'll, we'll talk a lot about Jesus next week too. But we're going to go back in time to the beginning in two weeks. I want to encourage you this morning. What is your life all about? Can you say the words that Paul has said? Are you making a plan right now for how you will say those words? 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. I want to encourage you to hold on to Jesus, to build your life on him as the cornerstone. Would you pray with me? Father, today as we think about these last days of Paul, we know that there were struggles. It was not an easy life. The descriptions that we get of him are a man who was scarred through many beatings. He was nothing of appearance to look at, just like Jesus, the description of him from the Old Testament. But I thank you for this man who dedicated his life to following you. And that we take encouragement in knowing that the same promises that you encouraged through the pen that he wrote with are the same words that we need to know of life today. That you, Lord, are able to do beyond all we could ask or even imagine. The list of encouragement goes on and on of the things that you encouraged through what Paul wrote to the churches. So, Lord Jesus, today I give you praise and I thank you that we have your word to know you and to know of your great love, your grace that is a gift that we've done nothing to earn. Thank you, Jesus, that you've made salvation available to us by putting our faith in you as our Savior, by asking you to send your Spirit in to live in our lives and through your forgiveness of our sins that separate us from you. Jesus, today, would you speak into the hearts of those who need to hear those words of assurance, those words of challenge to move beyond where we've been in life and following you. Thank you, God, for your great, great love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.